The world is made up of parts, and in machines, those parts are standardized. Once, that wasn't so. This is Origin Stories, Interchangeable Parts, the American Manufacturing Method. Today, we take it for granted when things fit together. If a part breaks, do we throw the whole thing out? No. The correct answer is no. We're looking at you, Apple. Or at least we shouldn't. We buy a new part and fix it. But not so long ago, it wasn't so easy. The idea that parts should be the same and fit together is a relatively new invention. Before the Industrial Revolution, parts were typically created by hand, one at a time. Everything was a handmade one-off. Even things that looked identical, like coins, involved individual artisans. Two political revolutions and two men, a well-known political revolutionary and a largely unknown industrial revolutionary, changed all that and changed the world. In 1776, American colonialists had it with British rule and launched a successful war of independence. Muskets and cannons were the weapons of war. People realized cannons should have the same standard size diameter so any cannonball could fit into any cannon. After all, during a cannon fight, nobody wanted to run out of cannonballs. Rifles, on the other hand, were far more common. Almost every soldier during the Revolutionary War had a custom-made musket, and each of those muskets were individually made. If one musket broke and another was lying around, soldiers couldn't simply swap parts. Furthermore, since each musket was handmade, people were expected to keep their muskets at home in case they were called to battle. France was a close ally in the U.S. War of Independence. After the U.S. victory, the United States sent Benjamin Franklin as the first U.S. ambassador to France, followed in 1785 by firebrand revolutionary Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson visited French master gunsmith Henri Leblanc, who demonstrated a new method for the manufacturer of guns. Leblanc's labor-saving method were unpopular with his French colleagues, so they locked him in the dungeon of Chateau Le Vincent for his own protection. It's never good to be unpopular at work, but back then it was really awful. Jefferson visited him there and was blown away by LeBlanc's new manufacturing process. Jefferson wrote to U.S. Secretary of Foreign Affairs Jean Jay about the new invention. An improvement is made here in the construction of the musket, which it may be interesting to Congress to know. It consists in the making every part of them so exactly alike that what belongs to anyone may be used for every other musket in the magazine. He presented me the parts of 50 locks taken to pieces and arranged in compartments. I put several together myself, taking pieces at azar, and they fitted together in the most perfect manner. The advantages of this, when arms need repair, are evident. He thinks he shall be able to furnish the musket to livre cheaper than the common price. Jefferson, known to detest monarchs and say things like, quote, a little rebellion now and then is a good thing, unquote, was probably not the wisest choice to send into a smoldering cauldron of angry French peasants. Despite local unrest, he was there to represent the interests of the United States and, okay, who are we kidding? This is Jefferson the Revolutionary, the guy who said the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. 
Sending him to France at that time would be like sending Lenin to advise Occupy Wall Street on how to deal with bankers. Inspired in no small part by Jefferson and in very large part by Louis and his wife Marie Antoinette, Locals launched a revolution in 1789. A quick review. Jefferson saw LeBlanc's method of making parts that fit together rather than being custom made. He wrote to the US excitedly. Then, while thinking about all the things that could be made with standardized parts, the French Revolution broke out. Realizing the already disliked LeBlanc might face trouble during a bloody revolution, and that LeBlanc's methods would be enormously useful to U.S. industry, not only for manufacturing rifles, but for manufacturing everything else too, Jefferson wrote to Henry Knox, the Zoftic Secretary of War. This method of forming the firearm appears to me so advantageous when repairs become necessary that I have thought it my duty not only to mention to you the progress of this artist, but to purchase and send you half a dozen of his officers' fusil. If the situation of the finances of this country should oblige the government to abandon him, he would prefer removing with all his people and implements to America. By January, 1793, they beheaded King Louis the 16th. Then they beheaded his wife, Marie Antoinette. Then, during the reign of terror, about 17,000 other people. Keeping his head about him, LeBlanc refused to leave France. Before going on, it's probably important to mention that LeBlanc lived through the reign of terror but his methods were never credited more than a really long footnote in the 1806 bestseller Memoirs de la Fabrication de Unproductive du Gouet. That book described assembling a musket from the various parts just as Jefferson wrote about it. LeBlanc died broke, a literal footnote in history, despite a monumentous invention. Back in the U.S., Jefferson brought the standardized parts idea to Eli Whitney. Years before, Whitney invented the cotton gin, a machine that automatically separates cotton seeds from fibers, making American cotton usable. Whitney's invention spawned the U.S. cotton plantation, creating an agrarian American South and vastly increasing slavery, though that's a different origin story. In the early U.S., it was Jefferson's job to grant patents personally. He personally was expected to process the patents, except Jefferson didn't like patents, so ignored granting them. This caused Whitney to lose lots of money as others knocked off his invention. Jefferson felt bad about that, so offered Whitney a new idea, using standardized parts for muskets. He went on to copy LeBlanc's demonstration, but couldn't get the parts to tighten enough tolerances, so he cheated, secretly marking which pieces to randomly pull out of the pile. Given Whitney's reputation, if anybody noticed, they didn't care, and he won a contract, built a factory, and his descendants eventually perfected guns with interchangeable parts. The fast-growing United States went on to use standardized parts for countless other things, especially clocks, watches, sewing machines, and Sam Colt's revolver that spawned the genocide against Native Americans while creating U.S. gun culture, though that too is a different origin story. Interchangeable parts came to be known as the American manufacturing method, despite the French invented it. Standardized parts were a key component of the Industrial Revolution and remain vital today. No matter how you're watching this video, computer, phone, tablet, or TV, it wouldn't be possible without Frenchman LeBlanc's standardized parts.